the scale of mobility. Uh, and what it's demonstrating is that the US does not rank high on class mobility measures, what you might call the American dream scale. Uh, and it's only getting worse. So essentially, if you are born poor, you are very likely to stay poor. Uh, the American dream is essentially a myth, at least relative to um, other developed countries. Um, and yet, compared to other countries, the average American reports that coming from a wealthy family is not important to success, um, and that rewards are equal to effort, and that income inequality is not a problem. So there's a big gap between the perception and the reality, uh, which means that in the US, it's very easy to be lazy when it comes to democracy and inclusion um, and equality because, um, because of this myth of upward mobility. Uh, we start with this not to make the point um, necessarily that libraries have a big informational role, although they do, but to say that it's easy in the US to feel like providing equal opportunity is enough. Um, and it's just not. We live in a country that values equality and opportunity, but prefers to ignore facts of systemic oppression and inequality. Uh, that means that there's haves and have nots, and the haves stay haves, and the have nots stay have nots. Hi. Income inequality is just one part of the sort of culture of domination landscape that we have in the United States. And again, we start with these beliefs and whys because if we cannot agree that the facts don't align with the reality of experience in the United States, both statistically and um, on a day-to-day -day experience for people uh, with lower privilege sets, then uh, we cannot agree on the rest of this presentation. Uh, this presentation is designed to help us get to a point where we productively discuss and then incorporate practices in our own institutions that further the cause of social justice and radical inclusivity. We won't get there if we don't have these um, core beliefs out of the way. So another component that we uh, in libraries sometimes believe is that even though we recognize that the profession is overwhelmingly white, we have a challenge in seeing that that impacts the sorts of services and the way we give service to our communities. And uh, there is a perception among librarians that we provide service in a neutral space and that we provide it equally to all of our patrons. There was a study done in 2017 that was later reported by the New York Times about um, government agencies and the way they interact with their communities. So the study had um, a bunch of people try to contact government agencies using white sounding male names and black sounding male names. Uh, what this meant was that they contacted um, police departments and county clerks, but they also count, uh, contacted libraries. In New York, there's a bunch of municipal publics. In the rest of the nation, most libraries are arms of government. Um, what they found is, although uh, when interacting with criminal justice or county clerk's offices or regulatory offices, um, people with black sounding names got the least good service, um, that difference in service between white and black or perceived white and black communication um, was also borne out in interactions with the library. So librarians across the nation treated black people um, or who, people who they perceived to be black um, with less courtesy and with slower responses and in some cases no response at all compared to their white counterparts with the exact same requests and the same language and grammar. Um, so it is us. <laughs> you cannot like, uh, you cannot offshore racism to uh, another division of the American experience. So uh, here are the beliefs that we think um, that will inform the rest of the presentation. Fairness is not inherent in our systems. Libraries should take seriously our professional ethics every single time, all the time. 
and it should be the feedback loop we use when testing our actions and our service motivations and even our policies and rules of conduct. <laughs> oh, oh wait. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And democracy requires equitability. Um, so let's get into, uh, we all know what equitability means, but we're going to go through a couple of examples um, before we move on from it. Uh, so if you don't know what equitability means, um, the, uh, the little memes that are up here right now are, uh, have, have been around for a while. They're, they're pretty common. You've probably seen them. Um, kind of gives you an idea of the difference between equality and equity. Um, uh, equality is essentially giving everyone the same thing, saying things like, our doors are open to all community members. If they choose not to come, then that's their problem. Uh, equity recognizes the playing field is not level, and so some people need um, uh, uh, need uh, more assistance, uh, more attention, more work on our part. They deserve more work on our part. So that would be like saying we provide uh, programs to help immigrants feel at home in our community, or we do outreach to marginalized populations specifically. Uh, ultimately, the ideal is to, to of course, tear down barriers uh, altogether. Uh, so again, going back to the, the why, starting with the why and going to the how and the what. Um, uh, why do we care about social justice? Because our professional obligation is to ensure equitable access to opportunity. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, we create a radically inclusive culture that seeks to understand bias and dismantle systems of oppression so that everyone in the community can achieve their full potential. And specifically, what is it that we do? Uh, we elevate all the voices in our community um, and that's how we fulfill our charge. So Let's what is radically inclusive librarianship, Margo? <laughs> so let's, yeah, let's talk about radical inclusivity. Um, we actually got this phrase from uh, an interesting article from a, a British academic librarian. Um, we've also seen it used in a lot of faith communities who are working on um, community social justice work or um, uh, community regeneration campaigns. So if after the presentation we'll send out um, uh, like a handout that we got from the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries that we like a lot that describes um, some of the ways some organizations approach radical inclusivity in their communities and also in their institutions. But it's empowering. It's equitable access requires elevation of less heard community members. You can, that's more than, empowerment is more than uh, providing access, right? It's um, providing access to the opportunity to create one's own agency or decision-making. So that, um, I hope that resonates with the people here. I can't see your faces because Zoom is only letting me see three people at a time. But <laughs> uh, that means that empowerment isn't something that you give to people. It's something that you allow them to have by not making decisions for them, but inviting them to the table to help them make decisions for themselves, especially decisions that impact them and their lives and their livelihoods. It's supportive. Um, we like to think of radical inclusivity as one way of describing uh, uh, the extreme version of a judgment-free zone. It's not really judgment-free. We're going to judge harshly activities that make people feel disrespected or unwelcome. But its intention is to normalize the wide sweep of behavior that people can exhibit in public spaces that don't cause anyone else harm, but that our internal biases may um, lead us to develop policies against or to criminal, criminalize or treat poorly. Um, this word regenerative simply means to create rebirth continually. Uh, we want our libraries in this way that they are agency creating engines um, to 
make that agency and that uh, social equitability happen throughout their community. So that that's a self-sustaining process. Um, and as librarians, we should be preserving our community and cultural memory. That is the community and cultural memory of all of the members of our community, not just those that um, have regular access uh, or whose stories are commonly told. Um, and this aligns with our professional ethic. It's not as though Eli and I made this up yesterday or even two years ago when we made when we first started <laughs> presenting on this topic. Um, it's this is an ALA code of ethics and equitability has been part of the code of ethics for about 20 years. So uh, this is not new news. What um, I think that's what's particularly frustrating to uh, us and maybe to you, which is maybe why you're here. It is frustrating that we've been having the same, a portion of the same conversation for so long with so little movement. Uh, so let's talk about getting it done. Okay, so this is the part where um, you have to participate. I mean, get to participate. Um, <laughs> at the bottom of the participant box, there's a check mark for yes that's green and a red one for no. So we're going to do a series of yes no questions um, and you have to pick one or else we're going to call on you. Um, <laughs> you can all hear me and know what the heck I'm talking about. Can you check the, the green check right now just so that I know it works? Amber, can you hear us? <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, are you out there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Amber can't hear us. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, well. Tammy? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people step away. <laughs> okay. That's, that's good enough. Good enough. Okay. <laughs> so the first question is, should your library support one political candidate over another? Looks like the field's turning red. Oh. Um. When we do this in person, we have people stand up and line up on a spectrum from yes to no across the room. So this is the first time we've done it in such a completely yes or completely uh, no way like this. So uh, most people said no. Uh, uh, and, and 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 by the way, if you want to clarify your answer, please put it in the comment box or unmute yourself. And uh, Christy, if you could watch the comment box and let us know. Thanks. So um, this one's a bit of a, a trick question. If you're working in a, a public library, especially if it's a municipal, you aren't allowed to, uh, your library is definitely not allowed to support one political candidate or over another. Um, and that's, Part of what we'll get into uh, deeply is that the only legality has to be about um, actual partisan politics, so things that happen at, at the voting booth, um, which, well, keep going. <laughs> All right, next question is, should your library support one political candidate over another if one of them is an open white nationalist? Anyone want to change their answer? Yeah, I gave a spoiler alert. You're legally not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for any of you, uh, and for any of you who are um, library directors and municipal employees, uh, you can't publicly support uh, a candidate while at work or in your role. Margo and Eli, we yeah. had a question. Is support a policy or a rule? Ah, great question. Um, if you, so in New York, there's a portion of you that are from New York and a portion that are from New Mexico. Or law. Yeah, right. Law. Yeah. Right. So if you're in New York and you're working for what's called an association library, or if you're in New Mexico and you're serving an unincorporated area as a nonprofit, 
Um, you're not a government employee and so have a lot of leeway in this. There's no, uh, that's no law, it's a policy. Um, if you're a municipal public in New York, uh, special legislative, school district public, or any other chartered library that's serving an incorporated area in New Mexico, uh, it's the law, it's the Hatch Act, uh, which is a federal law, not a state law. Good clarification. Uh, the next question is, would you use the phrase social justice in programming, public statements, or advocacy efforts? As an example, would you have a program that advertised social justice for immigrants Monday, 7 p.m. at the library? And this isn't really should you, but it's would you. Yeah, so like what would be the actions that you would take right now at your library? Oh. Anyone wants to say, um, I should be doing that, but my board doesn't let me or anything like that, you can put it in the comment box. <laughs> like Carolyn's, yes, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's, not a, it's not a common thing that we see in, uh, it's not a, a common thing that we see in programming titles. But it looks like most people uh, on this call would actually be comfortable yeah. doing that. Yeah. Interesting. All right, next question is, would you sponsor a program advocating the end of solitary confinement for imprisoned youth, knowing that the Democratic National Convention attendees would be touring your library? Uh, the key word here is advocating. Oh, it's taking a little longer to answer, huh, guys? <laughs> <laughs> so you're uh, it's advocating for a specific position to a specific political party that happens. Right, Sharona, you're right. Um, they're touring the library. You're not pledging support to a Democratic Party. All right. Ooh, even split. That's great. Uh, Juvenile and Justice and Solitary was exactly that. It's. Um, it was an installation inside the Free Library of Philadelphia downtown, the main branch. Um, and the installation was a solitary confinement cell that juveniles would live in, or you know, uh, it was a recreation of a solitary confinement cell for juveniles that many juveniles have to live in. Um, and it was designed and produced in collaboration with uh, a local nonprofit called Juvenile and Justice, but it was hosted and sponsored by the library. And it's um, part of its stated purpose was to make sure the installation was in place for the Democratic National Convention so that the politicians would see it as they toured the library. But they also have, well, before we move on, uh, Philadelphia also has a policy that supports doing programming like this, specifically. I, I can't hear you anymore and the slide isn't going on. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I think I accidentally bumped the mute button. Um, I was saying... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was saying that um, uh, when we talked to the uh, one of the people who actually put on this particular program at, at the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, they were almost surprised by our question because their social justice work is just something that that they feel is part of their mission. And they've got a whole uh, framework or structure 
and process behind how these sorts of things get approved. So the people putting on the programs um, are not worried at all about, um, about, um, about whether or not they're allowed to do it. It's very much part of their mission and their process. All right, the next question is, would you sponsor a panel discussion with multiple perspectives on new rules governing transgender bathroom use being considered by the local school district? All green. I think this is something that is changing very quickly. I oh, I'll, I'm interested to see if it changes after you transition the slide. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I forgot I hadn't transitioned the slide yet. Uh, what about if it was specifically supporting transgender rights on new rules governing transgender bathroom use at the local school district? So you were actually supporting a specific side. Yeah, this is pretty common. <laughs> 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 um, so the shift that we just saw is, is really common in the profession and super common um, when we do, when we ask this question of librarians just about everywhere. Um, a slide that we've never inserted because I think it would just be mean, but uh, I think is worth mentioning is um, if you it's February, it's Black History Month. Do any of you have programs about the end of segregation at your libraries as uh, a basic civil right and uh, with clarity of purpose? You know, nobody like uh, tries to host a panel discussion on the upsides and downsides of segregation, right? Uh, it's just a, it's just like a, Different time in history, right? All right, uh, next question. Would you teach protest skills to high school students? Just basic, how do you behave at a rally sort of things? Okay, most are pretty comfortable with that. That's pretty common. What about uh, if it's because they want to support gun control specifically? <laughs> right, it feels a lot harder when it's, uh, there's a specific agenda at hand, right? Um, and what about, sorry, what about because specifically they want to protest the president firing the special counsel? <laughs> I like this uh, answer from the librarian at JSPL. Right, the yeah. teaching is just about information, right? Regardless of how a person wants to use it. Right. Here's okay. <laughs> right, Sharona, I like that too. What's that? I can't see it. Oh, she says, um, we don't ask people why they're checking out books or why they need to learn how to use a computer. Right. Okay, next question. Is there a difference between not taking a side in a political debate and not taking a side on an issue of human rights? If you think there is a difference, please put it in the comment box. This slide sort of gets at the crux of the, the thinking the other slides are intended to uh, inspire. If we were in person, we'd have a really good talk right now, I promise. 
<laughs> All right, so most of you think that there is a difference. Does anyone want to say what the difference is? Uh, so the librarian from JSPL says human rights aren't political. Uh, but Sharona says, I would say no, because I think the vast majority of political issues are issues of human rights, even if indirectly. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, um, this is a complicated thing. And as, and we're living in a time where human rights is a, like a, a highly like partisan politics thing. Like there is a party that is less likely to support certain kinds of uh, human rights and a party that is more likely to support certain kinds of human rights. Um, and that's a very, uh, that makes it a lot harder to then say that we're not discussing partisan politics when we're talking about civil rights. Absolutely, C. Carter, absolutely. Or C. Carter. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so uh, moving on. If we're, are we ready to move on? Yeah. Okay. Um, when we talk about moving from sort of passive inclusivity to a more active radical inclusivity, um, uh, some of the things that we're talking about and moving from passive to active are things like um, uh, we're used to being a forum for information. Um, to be more active, you would actually fight for equal opportunities. Uh, the passive is provide materials from all perspectives. That's something that's very common in librarianship. We provide materials equally from all perspectives. Active is that you take targeted materials to where people are. Passive is be supportive. Active is actually hold a support group. Passive is be welcoming. Active is be welcoming, be welcoming, but have no expectations of particular behaviors in return. Passive is building a culture, and active is building a movement or community organizing. So do you guys have any other um, non-programmatic ways for a library to be radically inclusive? Um, programs are like the obvious one and it's what we focused on a lot in our yes no's but do you guys have any other ideas ooh great idea Carolyn uh, actively seek out board members from non-represented groups um, I'm the trustee development person at the southern tier library system and this is something I think about a lot that's a big one, yeah. Yeah, hiring and makeup of staff is important as well. So patrons see themselves represented, exactly. Um, one of the things that we see in perception studies of libraries is that libraries are a white space. So even when we're trying to recruit uh, librarians of color to public librarianship, they just don't see public libraries as a place where they belong. Listening sessions with underrepresented groups in community. I think that's a great idea. Even if it's just individual conversations that you seek out. Oh, and an extensive community assessment process. Uh, Kathleen, if you can give a couple tips on an extensive or a couple tools that you would use in an extensive community assessment process in the chat box, that would be great for us to refer to later. Thanks. These are all good ideas. I hope we all try them. Uh, some other ones that we thought of. Um, staff training is a huge one. Um, things like uh, policies that allow for non-conforming behavior or things like allowing people to sleep in the library. Um, community engagement work, like Kathy said. Uh, checking your own bias. So start with yourself and uh, really look introspectively at your own biases. Um, and supporting larger community efforts. So libraries don't exist outside of their communities. So 
you are always wanting to look also not just at the library, but at the wider community and how you can support larger efforts in the community. Eliminating fines, yep. Great, good ones. Yeah, really good. So are you ready to do case studies? Um, I am. <laughs> but everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, uh, we're gonna go through a couple case studies and we'll give you some time to think about them and then we'll sort of ask um, one question at a time and you can put the answers in. Um, Could we have, uh, is it where's... possible to unmute people? Yeah, uh, oh, there's a, is there a hand up? There's a clap, there's a need a break. Uh, but there's not a raising hand, huh? There's a thumbs up. Okay, so to the people. Um, if when you're ready to answer a question or you have a question about the case study or you're like ready to discuss, if you could put a hands up and Christy, can you unmute them when that thumbs up happens? Yes. Great. So the case study, if you haven't read it yet, a parent of a five-year-old has complained because your children's librarian read Jacob's New Dress at the last story hour, a book which describes a young boy who wants to dress up as a princess but gets teased by the other boys. She says, the mother says, you should have warned me. I have no problem with how other people raise their children, but I have the right to raise my child how I want to. The first question is, is it a role of the library to support gender non-conforming people in its community? We're getting well, lots of green yeses. That is, a, that is a yes, no question. So this one you can use the... Oh, okay. <laughs> Does anyone have a point of discussion on this? If you do, go ahead and uh, do the thumbs up. Okay, next. All right, next question. Um, should a diversity program be labeled? So uh, it's very common when libraries do diversity programming that they make sure to put it in bold in their advertising. This is the diversity story time. Um, or a drag queen story time. Right. Should, should that sort of programming be specifically labeled to avoid confrontations like the one in this example? Or does that just perpetuate a stigma? Yeah. Uh, So Tammy says it should be normalized. Tammy also has a comment that I don't want to lose, uh, but I'd like us to return to after this case study, by the way. Um, but it's not this one. Yeah, there is, so there's a tension between normalization and also like uh, helping market it such that people feel like there's a space for them. So people that are really supportive about um, calling drag queen story time, drag queen story time uh, often indicate the reason they wanted to do that was so that people who have gender non-conforming behavior uh, would see themselves in the programming displayed and see it as this like celebration thing. Uh, whereas people who do not support that kind of labeling have um, sort of aligned themselves with a lot of the comments here uh, one might say uh, the best idea is something in between, right? Like you do both. Like February isn't the only month that we tell stories with black people in them, right? Uh, April isn't the, or March isn't the only month where women show up in programming. So there is like a, there's some tension there, but it can be resolved through probably some intentional action. <laughs> yeah, Tatum Community Library says uh, you don't advertise stories about dragons. <laughs> why, why do we uh, specifically call out these behaviors? 
Uh, Tammy says, Indigenous Day is every day. <laughs> Carolyn says, every book can celebrate diversity. You could argue that the very hungry caterpillar normalizes eating leaves and promotes a vegan lifestyle. Especially if you partner it with a tasty vegan cooking class. Um, so the, the third question is, um, consider that this library, uh, the library staff in this example, and their board members had done a better job of building a, a culture of diversity and inclusion. Uh, would that have lowered the risk of confrontations like this one? Because the mother would just know that coming to the library meant that their child um, would be in an inclusive environment. And then the last question is, I, I yeah. just want to say, so you got those who have answered are evenly split between yes and no. And I think that you're all right, right? Like, um, we can always do a better job. And no matter what kind of job we do, that does not eliminate the possibility of someone being mad about a program that you give. Right. <laughs> Right there, there could always still be a person, no matter what you've been doing for the last five years, that comes in and is like, I can't believe you told my uh, little boy to wear a dress. <laughs> and you'll go, wait, that isn't, wait, that's not what I said. And then the last question is consider that, um, as in question three, consider that the, the library has built up this culture um, such that the community understands that the library is an inclusive space. Do you think community members would see the library as, as more valuable because of that? In general? Uh, librarian at JSPL, can I unmute you and ask you why? You don't, you can unmute yourself, I guess. I can unmute her too, or he. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So, yeah, I guess um, for those people who don't agree with inclusivity and don't agree that everyone should be treated the same, they would no longer feel welcome at the library. And so then you're eliminating a part of the community um, from, from being welcome, which is sort of an interesting problem. There's um, one of the things that you are, are getting at in that answer is that uh, there is a sense among a certain portion of all of our community's population that um, rights, like a, civil rights are a, like a finite pool and the more you have, the less I have. Um, I haven't solved the problem of how to talk to people about how that is, like that that is a, a perception problem, not a reality problem, right? Like that that's, like if, if you, um, allow for a reformed criminal justice system that doesn't make you more at risk of getting arrested. Uh, if you allow people to feel welcome in a space or you allow little boys to wear dresses, that doesn't make your not wearing a dress in danger, right? But it is, it, be, it, it creates a tension. It is a, it's a cultural shift that can be really, really scary for a lot of people. Right. So it's, I feel like those people who are scared of it would be um, not come to the library anymore. Do you think that there are ways that, so we're going to talk a lot about making social justice a very explicit part of library activity, but do you think that there are ways that you can make social justice a not obvious, like a, 
produce the results of radical inclusivity while making it less terrifying for people who are um, currently hold positions of privilege in the community without recognizing their own privilege? Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I try to do. I'm, I'm not saying that I think this is a correct position. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. No, or a desirable it's position a to be in. It's uh, a real one, though. It's just reality, and and I I wouldn't say. Well, yeah, um, I would say that that in this community, um, yeah, it's not necessarily tied to privilege in um, a wide scope. You know, there's there's um, people in poverty who would hold that opinion. Um, yeah. You get, the, you get at this other thing just now that um, uh, we always sort of grapple with in terms of the scope of this presentation, but um, the term intersectionality. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always taught and worked in, or almost always taught and worked in rural predominantly white areas. Um, and sitting across from a kid who has always felt that they have nothing and will potentially never have anything, who is white and male, um, and talking to them about um, privilege <laughs> is really challenging, right? Like they're, they're like, how, how dare you? How dare you say I'm in a position of privilege? I've never experienced uh, comfort, so how dare you? Right, like there's a lot of incredulity to have there. Um, yeah, and that's I like yeah, no, I understand it's intersectionality. I, I don't think it's along racial lines necessarily in this community, so. Um, so, oh, thanks, thank you for having that discussion with me. Mm -hmm. Before I move on, um, with, a, with a yes or no checkbox, um, is there anyone who's currently or has recently done uh, something like a drag queen story time or something like a story time as described in the case study? Um, Kathy, have you, Kathy or, uh, or Amy, would you like to unmute yourselves or, and tell me, tell us what you've done? Okay. Um, if you uh, if you want to jump in later, please do. I'm not really sure what the muting situation is. I think uh, she unmuted, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Oh, oh, hi, Amy. Oh, Amy, hi. <laughs> um, yeah, last year Albany Public Library hosted their first drag queen story time. Um, uh -huh. Did get some pushback from a few members of our community, but we, our library is located in a very liberal area of the city. Um, I mean, Albany in general is pretty liberal. Um, but we did get a few comments from some community members who were unhappy with us for choosing to do a drag queen story time. Um, we responded respectfully and um, posted it and had 100 something families attend and we're doing it again this year. Great, thank you. I have yet to hear of a drag queen story time that wasn't extremely well attended. I think um, actually read Jacob's Redress. Oh yeah, interesting. Uh, when I was in New York, uh, one of the libraries that was in my area, Olean, did a drag queen story time. There was a group that, that made a big fuss of it. Um, but because they made a big fuss of it, there was a huge turnout in favor of the story time. So we had about five people protesting with signs and I can't remember about 200 people showed up, uh, far more than could actually fit into their story time room. <laughs> it was uh, extremely, uh, extremely well attended. Um, next case study is, um, uh, there are up to 30 children in your library during the after school period uh, so it can be chaotic. 
This week, you have overheard three middle, middle school students use a derogatory word to describe another child who is an immigrant. It bothers you that they're not more welcoming, but you think, well, I'm not really their parents. So the first question is, is it any of your business how the children who come to the library feel about immigrants or people of other ethnicities? Is it your business? Those of you saying yes, feel free to put in the comment box why or no. The next question is, we got mostly yeses there. Um, what are some activities you could do during the after school program to foster an appreciation of diversity to try to sort of mi minimize some of that negativity in your library? Again, feel free to like use the thumbs up or uh, uh, take some take some talking space. Food is always a good start. Diversity <laughs> in eating. <laughs> Kathy works at the Belen Library that has a, um, a food diversity program. Isn't that isn't that right, Kathy? Can you um, unmute yourself and tell us about it? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. So yes, at the high school, the social um, science class has some sort of a World's Fair type uh, event at the end of the spring semester. And so we acquired a database that provides the culture and the content of foods from all around the world so that the students can look up recipes, but also learn about the practices and why different people in different parts of the world prefer or celebrate different kinds of food. Great. How is it? Is it working out pretty well? Yeah, it's a favorite activity. In fact, grown-ups sign up early so they can be one of the judges because then you get to taste all the different food that the students <laughs> make. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Do a culture study program on the various diverse groups and the kids in the group. Another another vote for food. <laughs> Sean Tande was also on. Uh, next question. What are some, I'm sorry. Uh, next question is: Does the immigrant child have a right to use your library without being verbally abused? That one you can do as a yes no. I like Carolyn's answer here, where. Uh, the answer is it's good to get to know your patrons in general. Hard conversations go over easier when you have a relationship with someone. Uh, and I think, I think that is always true. Um, it sort of also gets at it, uh, the librarian from JSPL too, right? Like those concerns, it's a lot easier to have more complicated, robust conversations when you have trust equity with the people in your community. Uh, Kakarter says, <laughs> which may not, be, <laughs> may not be how you wanted me to pronounce that. <laughs> uh, policies to address disrespectful and unwelcoming behavior, right? But we never want a policy to be a barrier um, to conversation with our, our patrons or our staff. It should be like a, a helpmate or a backup, but not the difference between, um, but not a way of avoiding having a a hard, a tough conversation when you can. Great, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any other examples of things your library can do to build a culture that respects that the library is a safe place for everyone? Things you're already doing or, or things you could do? Have any of your libraries ever done a human library program? Uh, 
a book club featuring immigration or something related. Good. Ooh, cool. Anna's area displays or uh, holds annual human library events. Would you like to tell us more about that, Anna? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. you. Hear me. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Um, Yes, uh, most of the events, uh, I work at the, one of the library councils, the sister council to Northern New York, and uh, we encompass four counties down here in central New York. Um, most of our events take place at public and academic libraries. We have, oh, I would say, about 10 libraries that participate annually. Um, we are now in the process of rebranding um, the human library event to something called Living Library or CNY Living Library because the actual human library people um, in Denmark are cracking down on applications and um, they're cracking down on the types of books that people can borrow. Um, most of the public libraries here are trying to cater more towards their patrons. The academic libraries um, really focus on the social justice books. Um, so, like I said, we're trying to rebrand this whole thing. It's extremely popular. Um, we'll have books from, you know, people that were in war-torn war countries. We have people from um, diverse backgrounds, LBGTQ. We have, um, you know, books on how to run a marathon, you know, um, with a prosthesis, you know, that type of thing. So. Um, it's, um, if anyone has any questions, they can get in touch with me, you know, Anna at CLRC.org. So, um, you know, I can help you out with that. Can you put that in the comment box too? I sure will. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. You kind of got at something that uh, Eli and I were just discussing yesterday, which is um, academic libraries seem to be more empowered to do social justice style programming explicitly than public libraries are. And, in part because of the same reason um, librarian at JSPL mentioned that there is a there's like a next level or another layer of of tension around providing social justice specific programming to uh, to the public in that you might make current users uncomfortable. So we just have a couple minutes left. Um, so here are a few things you can do to create a culture supporting social justice uh, that we've seen or that we've thought of. Uh, one is just say it often. So these days, libraries communicate in so many different ways. You talk with patrons, you have posters on your wall, you have Facebook pages, you have Instagrams. Uh, you have a lot of ways to get out the message. Uh, so it's important that when you're doing things like newsletters, uh, when you're making signs, just make sure you're including uh, inclusive statements and all of that. So newsletters, buttons, posters, displays. Do it often. So don't make it like a once a year social justice event. That's um, that's a lot harder than just being a part of your uh, being a part of your program and something you do regularly. Always start with why in advertising and all of your communication. So uh, rather than always saying what you're doing, start with saying why you're doing it first. So an example would be something like. Uh, 
the whatever library supports equal rights and equal opportunity for everyone in the community. Uh, therefore, this Saturday, blah, blah, blah. Be a social justice leader everywhere and from anywhere. So it's uh, not necessarily just up to the CEO to help build a culture. Social justice leadership can come from anywhere in an organization. So you can be that person, whether or not you're the director. Um, when you're in a meeting that asks the question, uh, how can we make this more equitable? Or how can we make sure uh, we have rep representation from everyone in the community? Uh, you can be the person who is who takes the lead on actively listening to the marginalized in your community. You can uh, be the model of the behaviors that help build inclusivity. Uh, and lastly, and possibly most importantly, make it part of your planning process. So all of this is easier if the work you're doing, the social justice work you're doing, comes out of a plan. Um, there's a library in New York that we talked to um, that was featured in a library journal article Margo and I wrote that had a uh, support group for LGBTQ uh, teens. Uh, even though they were in a very conservative area, they were um, able to make it a reality because it was part of a young adult planning process that the board had requested and the board had participated in. So when the result of the, part of the planning process was that there was a need in the community for an LGBTQ support group, it was hard for the, the board or the community, um, uh, even if you know, maybe their initial reaction was, no, we don't wanna do that in our library, um, it was hard for them not to support it. So it became very easy to do it. The quote from uh, Tammy's comment earlier is um, to have the, I find the best way to create a movement is to create community wide goals that the library could never reach alone. They require partnerships and this creates rich community and investment. And I think that's the right perspective that when we're talking about social justice or radical inclusivity, um, these aren't intended to be actions. These aren't intended to be a new body of work, but rather a shift in the way that we do work such that we are building that broader base of community inclusion, right? Thank you for that, Tammy. Sorry, Eli, go ahead. Oh, um, and then in terms of policies, of course, uh, having inclusive policies is uh, extremely important. So they should be um, uh, should be proactive about being inclusive and having universal programming. Um, the library's role is the provider of equal opportunity. Yeah. Um, do you want to take over? Yeah, I was actually just going to say um, these slides, like the, these last couple lists, will be. Um, in the email that Christy sends out after, uh, because we're now, I, I don't want to hold people much longer. Okay. We could skip to the. Oh, sure. Um, go ahead. I was going to skip ahead skip one more. <laughs> So we like to end on this uh, on this question uh, or on this statement, which sort of answers the question at the beginning, which is that um, you know neutrality is a myth because neutrality helps the oppressor and never the victim. Uh, this is us. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that we said at the beginning we do have a website where we put stuff from um, presentations such as this one. Uh, the website is hooray4.org. And this particular presentation is hooray4.org slash social justice. Uh, these are our contact emails if you want to get a hold of us. 
And the handouts that um, I'll share with Christy, or not the handouts, but the other resources that I'll share with Christy after the presentation to be included when she emails out the link to the recording um, can also be found there. Great. Any last comments or questions before we wrap up? Looks like Sharona does. Sharona, feel free to uh, unmute yourself. Oh, it was an applause. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I applaud all of you. <laughs> Good job having any kind of discussion on a Zoom. Yeah, that was actually <laughs> that was good. And thank you all for being so, uh, you know, flexible and things. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I'll go ahead and end the meeting. And thank you, Margo and Eli. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.